Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and speaking with all of you. Uh, Dr. Lee has given a wonderful background about why we should be interested in breast cancer, why should we still care. My talk is going to look at a little different aspect of breast cancer and look is at treatments and really a bit of a historical journey through breast cancer care because if we don't know where we've been, we can't know where we're going. And we need the historical background to help us prepare for the future. So my topic is um, titled From Radical Mastectomy to Targeted Therapy. Now, let's see, does this work? Yes. So this is the past. This picture dates from the 1880s. This was a picture here in New York City of a mastectomy, one of the early mastectomies being performed um, in New York. And you can see that surgical treatment 130 years ago was extremely different from what it is today. Uh, first of all, it's all male. And you can see our panel is very different. But no one's wearing gloves. This, if you look over here, suit and shirt of a gentleman, um, no masks, and a very, very different world. So the world and treatment of breast cancer has changed dramatically over the last century or so. Now, is this our future? You know, for all you uh, techies at trickies out there, uh, you recognize Dr. McCoy, and this is sort of our hope for what the future will be. Dr. McCoy will come to us run a little scan over us, and the answer will be there. Um, but this is not the future that we have yet. So what does the future really hold for us? Um, and the buzzword today and the focus on breast cancer care today is targeted therapy. And again, we can go back to William Halstead. Uh, particularly for this audience, I'd like to speak about him. He was a surgeon at Bellevue Hospital for the first few years in his uh, surgical career. And while here in New York, he developed the radical mastectomy, as well as the whole steady in principles of gentle handling of the tissues. And his approach to surgery is still very much a part of how we handle surgery. And he was the next step from that picture you saw earlier. Um, he eventually left New York, was the first chief of surgery in Johns Hopkins Hospital. But again, for you Brooklynites, he is still here with us. He's buried in Greenwood Cemetery. And you can go and visit him, should you, <laughs> should you wish. But, um, and in the 1800s, surgery was the only treatment for breast cancer. Um, and it uh, gives you a, an idea of what the surgery was in those days. This is a picture of a radical mastectomy. The breast is being removed. All the chest wall muscle is being removed. And why such extensive surgery? Um, women presented those days with very advanced cancers. The whole concept of screening for breast cancer didn't come about until the 1960s. And again, talking to a New York audience, I'd like to bring the New York aspect into this. The first program that looked at screening for any cancers in the United States was done here in New York. It was done by the HIP insurance program. And this looked at breast cancer screening. Because in the early 1960s, no one was screening for cancers. And this was a very simple project. They took 500 women who were covered by the insurance service. Uh, half of them got, mass, got uh, yearly mammography for five years. Half didn't. And they saw that in the group that underwent mammography, which was not a routine um, uh, part of health care in the early 60s, ha the women who got mammography had smaller cancers, uh, and had a much better survival. This study was the pivotal study that led to the whole concept of screening, not just for breast cancer, but for other cancers as well. 
And again, something to, that's uh, made in New York, so to speak. But to go back to the 1800s, uh, no one was screening, no one was looking for these cancers. Women would show up with a big locally advanced cancer. We only had these radical surgeries. Uh, and extensive surgery was the only hope for cure, and some women actually were cured by this. So what's changed? Um, and what's changed is that the surgeons are no longer working in a vacuum. We have very effective therapies that work in concert with us, uh, radiation, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, and again, the buzzword for the current days, which is of targeted therapy or specific treatments tailored to the specific biologic characteristics of different cancers. As Dr. Lee was uh, alluding to in her talk, not all breast cancer is the same. This is not a single disease, but a group of related diseases with different characteristics and, and different uh, 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 degrees of aggression. So we can go back and talk about radiation for breast cancer. And the first case of radiation for cancer in the United States was a patient who presented with a breast cancer. And a medical student in 1896 suggested to his professors that this lady, who had no other options for treatment, be treated with radiation therapy, which was a, a new technique. He had noticed that when x-rays were taken of the hands, you saw some changes in the tissues, and this led to this idea, and this woman responded very well. This was the first use of radiation in the US. And we work hand in hand with the radiation therapist, and I saw Dr. Hopperton here somewhere in the darkness, but we have one of our radiation colleagues here, and again, this is a true partnership. Nothing happens in a vacuum. Um, so in 1896, first case of radiation therapy for breast cancer. Uh, by the 1980s, there have been so many improvements in radiation support that this was able to allow us to transition from these earlier very radical extensive surgeries to focused surgery, to breast conservation using lumpectomy. And, and Forgive me, Dr. Hubbard, I'm simplifying this very greatly. Um, in the early 2000s, our approach to radiation continued to be refined and improved as we began to use more computer modeling and planning, and uh, the radiation therapists were able to focus their radiation care and prevent injury to normal tissues. Currently, the, one of the big interests is using pinpointed or targeted radiation therapy um, for appropriate patients. And this is very important. As we said, we work hand in hand. Effective radiation therapy has allowed breast conservation. This can reduce local recurrences by up to 50 percent. It's clear evidence this improves women's survival and cure rate. And looking into the looking glass, looking into the future, um, research is focusing on ease of delivery, simplification, and minimization of radiation therapy, and looking at efforts to minimize any sort of side effects. So that's one of the parts, one of the hands that helps us in terms of our breast cancer patients. Uh, the next uh, advance that has allowed us to move ahead has been the use of chemical treatments of chemotherapy in the treatment of breast cancer. And in the current days, we take this for granted. Yes, we use chemotherapy for, for cancers, not just breast cancer. But this is a relatively uh, recent discovery. Uh, during World War I and more so during World War II, the use of chemical warfare began to come into uh, use, and mustard gas was used, particularly during World War II. During the war, 
it began to be noticed the effects of mustard gas on um, bone marrow, on cell growth. And this was one of the warning uh, posters that were up in the uh, US barracks during World War II. Um, sort of a little heartwarming picture I thought everyone would appreciate. But it was realized that these, that some of these chemicals could affect rapidly growing cells in the body. And the thought was maybe this can help us affect, can treat cancers, which we know are very rapidly growing cells. Used first for lymphoma, but chemotherapy in the United States began to be used in 1956 to 1957. In the lifetime of many of us here, although I don't think we're going to ask the audience for participation on that number, um, chemotherapy was also the f used for the first time as an addition to surgery in breast cancer. So again, breast cancer has served really as a model or a paradigm for treatments of other cancers. Uh, and what are the problems? And everyone's aware of these concerns. Every pa new patient I see with breast cancer is most concerned about the possibility that they'll be recommended chemotherapy. This is uh, something that uh, women are very fearful of, something uh, that we are addressing through modifications and evolutions of treatment. Um, and again, the whole concept of targeted therapy, understanding the biology of cancer, focusing and being able to go for the Achilles heel or the soft spot of that cancer and get that and minimize the amount of side effects we see from treatment. And one of the successes of breast cancer has been our understanding of the HER2 new positive cancers. If you look at the biology of breast cancer, approximately one third of all breast cancers produce an extra protein called HER2 new. And in the, in the 1980s and 1990s, there was a great deal of interest in this, it was clear that those cancers were a more aggressive subtype. And by the 1990s, their monoclonal antibodies were developed, which could target and kill those cells that overproduce this protein. In 1998, uh, Herceptin began to be used for metastatic breast cancer. And by the year 2005, we were using it for early stage breast cancer. And this is one of the advances that has made a big difference in our patient survival. Hormonal therapy. Um, and again, looking at the biology of the breast cancer. And all, every cancer is not the same. So there are many cancers that are sensitive to estrogen uh, modification or modulation, and we have many tools we can use to treat those cancers. Tamoxifen, which was the original anti-estrogen treatment, aromatase inhibitors, sometimes removal of the ovaries to, pre to prevent uh, uh, estrogen production. So this has these additional treatments and this understanding of the biology has allowed surgery to evolve as we be, so again, the radical mastectomy was the first approach. Big cancers, big treatment, nothing else available. By the 1970s, we had the beginnings of radiate, we had radiation therapy available, we had early chemotherapy, um, anti-estrogen drugs were coming into use, and the mastectomies were uh, simplified and smaller surgeries were allowed to be done. By the 1980s, we were transitioning uh, to breast conservation, again, with the assistance of support. By 1995, we were looking at, again, reducing the volume of surgery, focusing on the disease and trying to spare normal tissues by use of selective lymph node uh, biopsies. Uh, for breast cancer, one of the first places the cancers will spread to 
is the lymph nodes under the arm. And we've been very interested surgically in treating this from the beginning. One, trying to eradicate any basins where the breast cancer may be. But also, this gives us an idea about prognosis and the aggressive quality of the cancer. So understanding the, the biology of the lymph nodes in the axilla is very important to us. So we transitioned from routinely removing lymph, all lymph nodes to testing one or two lymph nodes in the 1990s. And most recently, we have minimized and stepped back even further in terms of our surgical management by, uh, in select cases, using the selective lymph node biopsy or sentinel node biopsy without additional surgery. So again, bringing in the motif of the looking glass or the, uh, the crystal ball, what does the future hold for us in terms of overall breast cancer treatment? Again, targeted therapy, focused therapy. Knowing the biology, we can tailor specific treatments for that cancer. Prevention, we have to understand women who are at higher risk for breast cancer. Family history, personal history, genetic issues, and use of prevention. Prophylactic surgery. This is something that has garnered a great deal of interest over the last decade. Um, many public uh, personalities have come forward with their own stories about breast cancer. Uh, for those of you of a certain age, you remember Betty Ford coming forward. Um, in the 1970s and talking about her breast cancer. This opened up the discussion for women of a disease that had been kept very covert for many years. Uh, most recently, we've had women such as Angelina Jolie coming and sharing very personal aspects of their own uh, genetic history, very personal issues and very personal decisions. And now, with better understanding about genetics, and with better approaches to plastic surgery and reconstruction, there has been an upswing again in the use of mastectomy. Um, and as we've been talking about throughout, and what's going to be a theme throughout this evening, lifestyle issues. And these are hand in hand with everything else we use for breast cancer. Again, weight control, moderate alcohol, exercise. You're going to be hearing this, I'm sure, again from Marlene in the next few minutes. But these are, and these are things we can control. These are aspects of our life and our future that we can get a handle on and perhaps change our future. And that's what we're looking at. And that's what I think we are beginning to be able to offer to our patients. And I'd like to thank everybody for their patience here. And I'd like to switch the topics over probably to Marlene next. Okay. okay.